Thank you. At this time, I'd like to ask Gray Anderson, Assistant Chief of Wildlife, to come forward. Thank you, Commissioner Teague. Um, today, I guess we started this process several years ago, and so when we went through the, the first sort of public iteration uh, of talking about cranes, uh, the commission at that point asked uh, us to sit back, wait for two years, and kind of come forward uh, two years later and get ready for a 2014 season as necessary. And so what we've been working on as a wildlife division is kind of getting ready for that uh, and making sure that the groundwork is laid uh, as necessary uh, and then ultimately for those final decisions to be made by, by, by the commission. We're at a point right now where we're ready to go public. We've got a lot of biological uh, stuff taken care of and uh, ready to move forward. In the overall, what we wanted to do is kind of run you through a couple of things. And so a lot of folks don't understand exactly what the migratory bird season setting looks like. So I wanted to take some, uh, a little bit of time, run you through that so you understand the frameworks, what the frameworks are that we, that we work with with the waterfowl seasons how we get to those frameworks, who, put, who has input on those frameworks, and ultimately what the song and dance is with us and the feds uh, getting to where we are on any waterfowl season, and then ultimately talking about where we sit right now with our crane opportunities. The reason, I hope everybody knows this sitting in this room, that we're talking about a shared international resource. And so as a shared resource, we as Tennessee just can't just charge off and make a decision about what we want to do with any one given species. And in order to do that, and because of that, it falls under federal authority. That federal authority falls under the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And again, the Fish and Wildlife Service doesn't want to just bite off and say that we're going to dictate to you what you're going to see in your states. And so they've come up with, and this has been in place since the uh, late 40s, early 50s, depending on which flyway, all of our migratory water birds, and this includes our webless, our webless birds, webless migratory game birds, and our, and our standard waterfowl, geese, et cetera. Uh, all of these are managed under our flyway system. And so we have a national flyway council and then a respective flyway councils for each of the major administrative flyways. Uh, those flyways have representation from each state or province that's associated with that flyway. So we go to these meetings, the things that we discuss here as a state, we can take to, the, to those national meetings. Those things are taken on to the international scale. So it, it, it provides this ability for information to pass from the lowest level to the highest levels, and everybody's comfortable with that because everybody has a say. Uh, the council, which is typically a group of administrators, uh, is the main decision-making group for each of these flyways. Uh, each state and province has one council representative. That council representative is typically supported by a technical committee, and that technical committee is often the waterfowl biologist, uh, the non-game biologist, the ornithologist, whatever the situations may be, to provide the science of the system to the administrator that's going to be actually making those decisions. And so even at this level, we're talking about uh, multiple a management person and administrative person making sure we're making the right decisions from our perspective. So the councils get together, and these councils meet a couple of times a year, and they provide these frameworks. And so the Mississippi Council represents from the, the coastal states all the way to the Great Lakes states. And the framework is basically what you consider outer limits or, you know, the maximum number of birds in a bag. Uh, the, 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 you get a 107-day season. Where are we going to start that season? Where are we going to end that season? That's your basic framework. And so everybody in the, in the 14 flyway states and the three provinces in the Mississippi flyway get together and decide we can live within these frameworks, these maxes, these mins. This is where we want to go. The other part of that, and it's complex where we get to today, is we have two different frameworks that are chronologically offset but go through the exact same process. And those frameworks are an early season, which is primarily your migratory webless birds, which includes cranes, rails, uh, woodcock, all of those. Uh, also includes uh, early season teal, early season wood duck, and early season Canada goose. So those go through on an early season process. Then we also follow that up a month or so later with the late season process. So we have two identical processes going on just a little asynchronously. So what comes out of those, all those flyway council meetings is ultimately a recommendation. That recommendation is then sent up to the Fish and Wildlife Service Migratory Bird Office Management. They bring all of their army of PhD biologists together and, and evaluate those frameworks. And then after some period of time, they recommend their framework for each flyway to the Service Regulations Committee. And that Service Regulations Committee uh, then takes 
the regulations that they support, the frameworks that they support, and publish them in the Federal Register, and that's when they're open for comment. The SRC, this SRC, the Service Regulations Committee, is what was what met a week ago today to make to look at our early season stuff. So the stuff that we're going to be talking about with our early season regs is about a week old. So we're we're right on the cusp of this, trying to get this information out to everybody. Uh, but that's where we sit on that process. After the public comment, Fish and Wildlife Service takes those public comments, makes a final recommendation, and put into the public into the Federal Register. And then once that's finally approved, that comes back to the states. And that's when we get to select our frameworks. And that's when we as a state uh, go in there and select what days we want to hunt, where we want to hunt, how we want to hunt, and we select within that framework. And so we're picking our season dates, bag limits, et cetera. The great part about this is we can only hunt 60 days out of 107 days. So we can, be, we can shrink down, choose which 60 days we want to hunt, which bag limits we want to choose if we want to shrink, but we can never go more. So we're going to have this large scale framework that we can work within, but obviously we can only go more conservatively. We can't go more liberally. So that in a nutshell, in a very exciting way of looking at federal administration is how we basically get to the end of, of duck seasons and how we get our duck season set. This is a, is a little bit of a grainy slide, but it comes off of the, the Flyways website. You can go find this at, I think it's flyways.com, but it's, if you type in Flyways, you can find this. And it starts talking about the migratory bird regulation cycle. And typically, let's see if I can get this going, uh, meetings start in January. And so we'll start with the federal meetings. And then this is where the states intervene, the flyway technical. Our technical guys go meet in February. So we send our wildlife biologists, our, our waterfowl biologists go sequester themselves and hammer out the biology of the system. The council meets a month later in March to look at administratively, Do they agree with that send it back to the feds, all that goes the same for early and late. And then you'll see early seasons split and go one, one direction, so we're talking teal, and in this case on a national scale, uh, cranes uh, versus the late season, which is a little bit later. We're still talking about data inputs at this point, and then they start the same exact process with the SRC framework proposals, et cetera, et cetera. And where I'd like to talk about today is this is where we sit at this point in time. So we just got through from the early seasons uh, regulatory stuff, we just are sitting at earliest looks at what our early season frameworks are going to be. Uh, some of the other data inputs uh, for the late season, uh, is we're still gathering information. So what are we looking at? Oh, and this goes back to cranes are a little bit different because cranes right now in the eastern population are still being hunted as an exper experimental season. And so when you, when you do get approved for a season, it's typically a three-year experimental season. As such, um, they have a little bit of an extra step, and they're also a shared resource. So, like most of our other most of our other ducks, are only Mississippi flyway. We're only dealing with them as a flyway, as what our normal 14 states and three provinces, because they come down through the Great Lakes and then cruise over into Florida. We start sharing a resource with uh, the Atlantic flyway. So we have some additional stuff going on. So basically these plans need to be submitted an additional year ahead of time so everybody can get a good look at it. It has to go through the Atlantic Flyway. So our Tennessee plan had to be approved by Connecticut, you know, so not just Connecticut, but the Atlantic Flyway as a whole. So this is extra sets of eyes looking on what's going on. So essentially you take this and strike that out. And so let's look at what's going on here, what, what we did to get where we are right now for cranes. And this becomes an eastern sandhill crane population, but it has these additional steps. So we met as a council a year ago, July, submitted our hunt plan. The technical committee submitted it, uh, our hunt plan to the technical committee who presented it to the council, and it was approved by both of those bodies. And then it went into the, into the normal process into January. Goes through the normal process through March. Then our, all the things that were being approved then not only go back through the Mississippi Flyway, but also get shifted over to the Atlantic Flyway to get another set of eyes on it to make sure they're comfortable with what we're doing with cranes. Then we roll on and we get to exactly where we sit today. And so the, just to let you know, these very formal processes occur very the same way. This is like the cycles of the moon, you know, and so when, when, it's, when it comes around, it comes around and that's just the way it is. Um, and so that also gets into making changes to plans and, and altering things uh, becomes very, very difficult because we've already gone through a, an 11-month process to get where we are. Making many changes uh, is, is, especially expanding changes, becomes difficult. So where do we sit right now? The early season 
Service, Regulatory, Service Regulations Committee uh, just released it. Like I said, we're talking, I got them, I made a phone call last Friday and got a basis of this. I got the actual email with the stuff on it on yes, yesterday. Um, it has the webless migratory stuff. I can tell you what our coot regs are and that kind of stuff if you're interested, but it's all the standard stuff. Um, we got our early waterfowl also came through, and then what most people are here to talk about today and interested in, the proposed framework for the Sandhill Crane season. Looking at our late season, just to let you know, like I said, we're talking about the exact same process, asynchronously working. We're still collecting data. If you remember the, back to the graph, all our breeding bird surveys and our May pond counts have been done. They're being analyzed. Now they're flying all of these surveys. Uh, getting uh, all of our uh, breeding population information is out there and being counted. So that we're still in data collection for the late season process. And this is sort of a bit of a slight side note, um, but it, it's a little bit of a glitch. We didn't know where else to add it into this. And so uh, at this point, we, we're still looking at a late season a liberal package, which is six birds in 60 days. The, the, the problem is when Thanksgiving backs up late into November, um, our 60 day season, when you take it to the last day of the season and then start adding back up, our 60 day season in our starts on Thanksgiving day. Hunters aren't really keen on that typically. And so the other option is to take a day away and start it on Friday. Well, legislatively, they didn't like that either. We got a, a resolution a few years ago on that. So uh, the, the suggestion from the regional waterfowl, and, and I think everybody agrees with this, is we're looking to do a, a, an internet-based survey to ask waterfowl hunters and hunters in general, we have this little bit of a conundrum, do, you know, because the conundrum is, do we hunt on Thanksgiving Day opener, or do you move it to the Saturday before, which is opener of deer season? So we have two kind of unpopular options, you know, or potentially unpopular options. We would like to extend that out to the, to the waterfowl hunters and ask them where they preferentially would like to start that season. So uh, it, a little bit of a side note. Are there any questions on that little side note before we get going? We kind of wanted to make you aware of what we're thinking about in that um, in case you saw something pop out. I hadn't, since you brought that up, I hadn't brought, asked any of the big duck hunters, and they may have a fit but, but might I suggest you ask about an opening the Saturday before deer season we looked at that um, it, it, it creates a really large gap and a lot of our WMA guys also didn't think we could get our ponds in place all of their impoundments in place by that point it really puts a additional pressure on the WMA staff to have quality hunting that early in the season they're they're geared up the crops are planted everything's planted for a different time scale so we, we looked at that. We didn't think it was an option uh, and, and thought these were the two most viable options as an agency or as a division in a wildlife management unit. Sir, also, uh, so many of the duck hunting areas are dependent on runoff, and you haven't had the rains by then. So a lot of people will uh, well be hunting on dry ground, and around here that doesn't work very well. So if we go that far ahead of Thanksgiving, I, I don't think it would be much of a season. Or right. much of a start yeah that and that was the concern we, we looked at it but I didn't see it I think it'd be appropriate just to set it out there and let the public decide it really didn't make any difference to us we would just want to make sure that we don't cut down less days than the 60 that the fed federal people allow right. us to so don't y'all agree just let put it out there for the public and whatever you get and you come back with us I'm sure we'll approve it okay all right that sounds good this will probably be a survey monkey type survey that will be news release go go check in with your hunter ID so we don't have people voting a thousand times you're gonna to have to use your your uh, TWRA ID number so get some idea of that just want to be be aware of that okay now jumping back in uh, now we're talking about the exact what, what, what actually came out of the SRC um, and, and this is our hunt plan uh, recommended uh, these things so what we proposed to the feds we pretty much got everything we wanted back out of the feds uh, and we proposed to the federal uh, to the government to the, to the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, a 60-day concurrent season with the late waterfowl season understanding uh, that that's going to be closed during the crane festival weekend so our initial plan said we're going to be 58 days you'll probably see a recommendation out of the agency that will probably close Wednesday through Sunday around that uh, but we we are approved for the full 60 days again we can always go more liberally on any of these so we can cut out those days that we want to do around the, claim, the Crane Festival. Uh, the actual zone that was approved that, that's currently uh, as proposed uh, is east of Highway 56, which is this line right here, uh, and south of Interstate 40. And so primarily includes uh, the two 
impoundments uh, just south of there in Hawassi, and then I believe it includes Watts Bar as well. Uh, hunting hours, same as the late waterfowl, except we're going to close the season on public lands at 3 p.m. Also understanding that refuges are not going to be open ever, and so like Hawassi Refuge is, is a waterfowl refuge, so we'll never hunt that. All other public lands are going to close at 3 p.m. Uh, this was uh, in lieu of a, of a buffer system, so this allows the birds to go back to roost without harassment to the, any public land that they might be using. The, the permitting process, a little bit different than Kentucky. Everybody's allowed to do things differently. Uh, the, we're allowed to take 2,325 permits. That's based on 10% of our, of our five-year, 10% uh, of our five-year uh, winter counts. Uh, and we decided to do them in what they were calling three permit packets with the assumption that, a, that one, per, one hunter with one permit, not likely to go out there and hunt, but if they had an opportunity to take three birds during the season, that, that they may be more apt to get involved. So we have 775 three permit packets that will be issued with a handheld drawing uh, on or near the Hiwassi area uh, at some point before the season to issue those 2,325 permits as a maximum number of, of permits issued. Uh, as, as Kentucky, I mean, all these things are required by the feds. Reporting, all harvested cranes must be tagged and checked in. So we'll have a tagging system uh, and a check-in system to make sure the cranes are, are in place. Uh, and part of our plan, all the hunters must pass an ID test, and we're going to have crane ID information wherever we can get it, but most importantly on each of those permits that they're going to be carrying with them in the field. Uh, we'll do everything we can to make sure anybody, you know, misidentification was, is not going to be an issue. And we'll probably take up uh, Commissioner Gassett on his video <laughs> that they already have on the internet. I can imagine that's already a positive. Um, okay, so what we stand right now is this just, this is what we got essentially verbally out of the SRC at this point. It's not officially published in the Federal Register right now. What they're going to do is the feds will come through in uh, late July and, and publish what we've just talked about as our frameworks for the state of Tennessee to hunt sandhill cranes. Uh, for the next three-year experimental season. Uh, that's going to be late July is the first time we'll see this thing officially public. After it's published, there'll be a 10-day public comment period uh, that uh, you, can, you can post any comment to the, federal, uh, to the feds for that. Uh, those comments uh, will be considered in early August. Uh, the final frameworks will be published in the Federal Register uh, in August. So that process will go pretty fast. Once, the, once this Federal, once it gets put in the Federal Register, it goes pretty quickly after that. And then we'll be handed back our state frameworks right before our uh, commission meeting in late, June, in late August. We'll, we'll know exactly what our frameworks are going to look like. And at that point, the commission can make the, the recommendations uh, on what our framework and, and hunt season uh, would, would look like. And so, and again, going back to the idea that that late season uh, or any of those uh, proposals that we want to do must be within the framework of what's been proposed as it sits right now by the, by the flyway, by the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. So in a, a quick summary, and so we've gone through an 11 year, 11 month biological review. And so we've been working hard on this. There's been some gaps that have been slow and whatnot. I counted them up today when I was putting this talk together. Uh, there's at least nine levels of professional biological review that this has gone through. Various committees, various panels of biologists, technical committees. Uh, everybody has taken a look at this. This includes two flyways, uh, and uh, I don't even know how many biologists have looked at our proposed plan. Uh, the, pr the framework will be published soon, as we've said. There's, there's the basic outline, 60 days, 2,325 permits to 775 hunters. Southeastern portion of the state, 3 p.m. closure. Uh, we do look, again, to, to buffer the, the crane festival to make sure we don't have any conflicts at that point. Uh, so we, we, that's one thing. We'll go back with this uh, idea of being conservative uh, rather than liberal, you know, liberal on these things. And so out of that 60 days, we'll probably carve at least five of those days out uh, between now and August and, and say we don't want to hunt those days, even if the Fed offers them to us. Uh, and then back for the basic... Uh, comment period, and this is the key issues for anybody that wants to talk about, you know, what, how to talk to the feds. The federal comment period is going to be open in late July, according to federal register processes. We as a state are going to start taking, taking comments uh, immediately after the commission, or as quickly as we can after the commission meeting tomorrow. We'll open up our standard TWA comments, email, uh, and make sure people 
know how to reach the TWRA if they would like to make a comment uh, to, to us or if they would like to make a comment to the feds. And I hope I didn't burn through how we get the federal regulations in place uh, and where we sit right now too fast or too complex, uh, but I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, that the commission has at this time. Thank you, Gray. Um, I have a couple of questions. One, one, I'd like for you to get all of the commissioners a copy of this so that so we can answer questions since we have a two-month period before we'll be meeting again. Sure thing. And also, um, it is my understanding that we have to make a decision about for all federal wild uh, waterfowl in the month of August, correct? That's not correct. something that we can talk again in August and then put off till September. It right. has to be done. And that's yeah. one of the reasons, even though we're not even going to vote or anything today, we wanted the parameters laid out so that at least we, the public would know so that we could have the comments. And so that's the maximum what you presented today, but we can always back off of anything, correct? Exactly. Exactly. Right. We went we went with Max on everything, uh, and, and then again we can be more conservative as right. necessary. Okay. Thank you very much, Commissioner Cannon. Great. Three uh, three quick questions on the tagging. Um, we're starting to go to an electronic process on wildlife. Anyway, is that something that's going to be available for waterfowl or? How will that work? Uh, not does, not at this work? not at this point. I mean, as okay. far as the cranes go, you know, because a lot of this because we started so long ago, uh, trying to get anything electronic where Kentucky went, you know, maybe in the next iteration, you know, if we if we choose to go forward and get, and then do another iteration of a hunt plan, uh, I think it would be wise at that point to to look at a different way to distribute permits if we choose to do that. Uh, it, it really is administratively quite simple for us to do these handheld draws uh, at this point in time. Uh, you know, the restricted area, we didn't know exactly how much interest we may or may not have, and especially the, the, there's birds that hop in, but there weren't a whole lot of birds when we first started talking about over there. They're really packing up. Um, so the handheld draw was an attempt to pull people that would really use the permits and not just have them distributed across the state. And uh, so, but I think in the future, we'll see uh, this, this process mature that, that that brings it into a more modern uh, process it is and with respect to the actual tagging of the bird after mm -hmm. it's been taken will we be able to do that electronically or is it not not right now okay and so right. and that that just goes back to the the difficulty in, in dealing with getting the real system changed that's we're hoping to do something you know I've thrown out and I don't promise this at all but I think something as simple as business the, the permit would actually be or the ta the check-in or not the check-in but what you mail us would be some sort of business reply so it wouldn't even cost the hunter anything they just tell us what they do and drop it in the mail and it's okay, done and you're promising what I want to make sure I've got that down let me make sure who's That's taking it. notes <laughs> yes no second so, you got it thank okay. you I appreciate it the second question is really more of a point of clarification uh, for me and the folks that are here, we're going to begin accepting comments on this as promptly as possible tomorrow, Monday, whenever that falls in place. Those comments are not what goes to the feds. If somebody wants to comment on the federal register, they have to do that separately. This is only for correct. TWRA and the commission. Absolutely correct. Okay. And so that's why we'll, we'll put it in there that what we're doing to collect our public comment, that will go through our normal exact same email you know that that we do for all of our other hunt seasons and so to get public comment uh, we'll make sure people know that the federal register is a completely different system and that is going i think it goes to minnesota uh, for their final the people that are going to be looking at that that go through that review process last question unrelated to cranes the early season dates have those been set is, have we been given that information I mean, they, they pretty much don't change. I mean, and so I can get you those, but most all of our early season uh, dates are uh, standard wood duck openers, standard Canada goose openers, you know, second Saturday for the wood duck teal season, right. first Saturday for, you know, uh, for the, the goose. Are those formally official when the feds bless everything in August? Or yes, is that, okay. yes. That, everything at this point every early season is exactly where the cranes sit ready for open public comment and so uh, but uh, it will all become official in late february or late august for us to, to to move on at that point thank you sir appreciate mm -hmm. it any other questions from the commission 
if the commission decided we wanted to have a computer draw, is August, if, if, if the commission votes to have a hunt, if the commission votes to have a computer draw statewide, is August too late for you to do that? Do you need to know that now? Um, I, I don't, it would, it's gonna be extraordinarily tough to get a computer draw in place for this season. Um, mainly, it's still gonna have to go through, we, there is a chance you could talk to the feds through the public comment period and change that. Yeah, I, I would say that's very low. If the commission chose to do that, I would. So I don't miss. Why do they have anything to do with it? Why don't because we? the hunt the, because the hunt plan that they approved, which included how we draw and the, the how we draw, said we will do a handheld draw on that area. So I, I would suggest the best thing for the commission to do would be when we go to the July com council meeting um, and talk and try to amend our hunt plan. Uh, to allow for that different kind of draw. And I don't think they would balk at that at all, uh, but I think it would be a more palatable approach and go through this first year with a handheld draw and then work on a computer draw after that. Great, how is the, the handheld draw, the handheld draw going to work exactly? Where would they go uh, to make their application and, and so forth? Those are, you know, those are things that, that the region has been, been working on. I think we'll have to see a final uh, uh, bit of outreach on exactly where that's going to occur, but it would be somewhere in that area. John, do you have any idea of exactly what you'd have planned? No real specifics. It'll be in the high velocity area and get the, the local folks there involved. But our guys are really willing and ready to go. And so, would just occur on one day and you'd have to show up and uh, make your application on that day and then the drawing would occur that same day I mean is that is that typically what we do with some duck blinds and, and uh, big sandy and yeah, I'm shaking my head yes but really the specifics are not in stone yet. right and because it's so new and, and and I think there will be Commissioner Ripley a a big draw you know with some sort of a draw but then we we very much believe there's going to be leftover permits so I think we're going to have to figure out if there if we can distribute those through some other system you know to get to get the rest of those permits uh, issued out, you know so I, I just can't imagine we're going to have almost 800 people show up to, to that well that's my thought too I, you know it just seems to me that uh, if we could do it on the computer it certainly would encourage uh, participation in the sale of permits and so forth just just the way of the world now right you know right Great, just by um, looking at the map that you had for us there. So the majority of the, if, if it does pass, is the majority of the land that'll be huntable, is that private? So you have to know someone or is, is that primarily I, it, right? I understand, I'm, I'm not terribly familiar with that area and I, I was giving John a hard time because Kirk didn't show up today. <laughs> but I think most of that area, and John, correct me if I'm wrong, is, is gonna be private land, you know, okay. with the normal reservoir public. Right, okay, that's great, so, thank you. If I may add one thing, uh, we'll have to check with our legal staff whether or not we could even do a computer drawing for Sandhill Cranes. It's, it's laid out by rule what can be done and the, the computer drawing allocation procedure is very specific and it talks in the rule about being able, if you're drawn for a waterfowl computer drawing, you could bring other hunters along with you and I don't know if that applies. I, I don't think that would apply to the Sand Hill Crane. So there's a strong possibility that a, a computer drawing would be out of the question unless we do a rule change. Anyone else in the commission? Anyone from the audience? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. For uh, Chairman Teague Moves, I'd like to recognize a former commissioner, Boyce Magley's in the house. So thank you for showing up today, Boyce. I have a question for Commissioner Magley. It's 58 days. You're sitting in my seat, Cotton. <laughs> <laughs> it's well filled. <laughs> Is 58 days enough days to duck hunt? Well, given it's 60, we need to hunt 60. So. Oh.
All right, moving along. Uh, next, I'd like to uh, recognize Ron Huff, president of the uh, TOS. Here or here? Where are you first? That's okay. Uh, first off, my last name is Hoff, H-O-F-F. -F. Get that correct right off the bat. I'm the current president of the Tennessee Ornithological Society. And um, first thing I wanted to say is uh, we'd like to commend TWRA for going the extra mile to requisitioning and organizing this survey. And uh, they didn't have to do that, and it showed a measure of um, their resolve to get this right. And um, we also appreciate that TOS was invited to uh, suggest some topics to be included in this survey. And um, uh, when uh, Mr. Anderson was going over that, uh, he was saying 2,300 birds could be taken the first season. Uh, is that a requirement? Do we have to take that many, or do we have? Can we go with a far fewer number, like Kentucky is, to try to be, you know, since this is experimental to begin with? Well, it's 2,300 permits. Right? Yeah. Uh, 2, you can take up to 2,300 okay. birds. And uh, he was saying that that was 10% of the population. Uh, personally, uh, I've only ever seen about 17,000 down there. I don't know where that figure comes from. Maybe that's the entire area. But uh, certainly I would hope that uh, they would take far fewer than that and start slowly on this if they're gonna do it. Uh, of course, our organization would prefer you don't hunt sandhill cranes. It's, it's not an absolute requirement. We have hundreds of tens of other species that we can hunt. Uh, they're a um, enigmatic species. I know there's uh, the numbers have been wildly fluctuating. I've read emails lately that uh, the numbers vary anywhere from they've increased from 30,000 to 88,000. I think I heard today. Um, I saw an email the other day from what seemed to be a respectable resource, and that number is not 88,000. It's more like 60. So the numbers are fluctuating some, and um, this is a species that doesn't breed like rabbits. They're lucky if they get one crane a year that survives to adulthood. And um, uh, TWRA, as I'm sure you all know, is a, a vast agency. Um, I'm incredibly impressed at all the things they do do in the state. And um, contrary to what the um, commissioner from Kentucky was saying, this is not a free deal. The answer is usually money. And uh, uh, Mr. Gray, or Mr. Anderson, I'm sorry, uh, was just saying that they've done all the legwork on this and all that, and nobody did that for free. These are tens of thousands of dollars that are hard-earned dollars. All the agencies in the state, all the cities in the state are hurting, sequestration, paying off our national debt. Money is gonna be tight down the line, and this will cost money. The tags cost money, the people checking the tags cost money. The people going out there checking these birds in and everything else, all of that costs money. And what could that, you know, if we don't have this hunt, that money can go to other things. And so this is not a free deal. So uh, please take that into consideration. This is a fee-based agency. I'm sure you all know that. And um, um, I think it's often overlooked how much wildlife watchers do contribute to the local economy. Um, just. As an example, yesterday my wife and I came over early because we have never bird watched in Williamson County. Not exactly a hot spot of bird watching, but uh, we wanted to go on the Natchez Trace Parkway, and so we spent a hotel last night, 95 bucks. Tank of gas, $50. Food for a couple of meals. So you're looking at a couple hundred dollars just to come over Williamson County, and that doesn't even count Sand Hill Cranes. So wildlife watchers throughout the state are often underreported vastly because we do contribute a lot to the economy. And not just bird watchers, I'm talking about people wanna go out and see Bambi and all the other things. And um, the issue of having this uh, hunt um, in the Hiawassee area, uh, he was saying we would close the hunt, they'd try to close the hunt on Wednesday. Now, when you're out there being shot at, uh, the birds are not gonna stick around because they don't wanna be shot at. And if you close the hunt and have, or you decide to have a hunt and you close the hunt on Wednesday, um, I'm not sure that's enough time for those birds to actually come back. You'd almost, it looks to me like they're just gonna have to have some leeway more than just a few days. 
because I don't think they're going to return, and that's going to significantly impact that festival. And this festival is several thousand people now and growing all the time. So just some things to consider. And uh, we, as the organization for Tennessee Ornithological Society, we prefer that you not vote to have this hunt. It's not a requirement. I know hunters like to hunt, and I used to do a little hunting when I was younger too. But um, it's not a requirement. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I wrote a few things down. I'll, I'll ask Gray to come back up and uh, address a few things that I um, just wrote down while we were, um, you know, listening there. Um, uh, we talked about success rate a little bit. Could you talk about the number of permits issued uh, versus what we could expect the actual success rate and maybe compare that to like our deer, uh, right. you know, the total number of deer that could possibly be killed and then what, you know, is, is actually happens. Right, and, and it goes back. I mean, the permit system is, is the feds are very comfortable with what our permit system is right now. We're going to be issued 2,400 permits. We, we've chosen to issue those in three permit packs of 775 with the expectation that it's not going to hit 50% of any of that's going to be, you know, of our harvest. Uh, the, the estimated harvest is probably going to be, you know, a quarter of what we have here, when, which is about what Kentucky saw. And Kentucky does their system very differently. You know, like I say, uh, their commissioner said that they have the ability to close down once they hit 400. So their, their max quota was 400. And so, and they never even came close to it. Ours is going to be very similar to all of our other hunt draws where we issue uh, X number of permits and know we're going to kill Y number of animals. And so we manage based on Y, not necessarily on X, unless we know those values change. These numbers that the feds have, have provided within their framework have been heavily fleshed out, vetted, however you want to think about that on the national level, looking at percentage of birds on those staging areas, how many birds uh, are there, how many birds can we take, what would the ultimate impact of those populations be. Uh, and and there's, there's strong science behind the fact that we're not going to touch. You know, right now we're, we're probably going to be in the uh, less than 2% if we in Kentucky had pretty good years next year less than 2% of the total harvest or the total population, uh, not including this latest one, which is the latest number that came out was 87,000. The number that everybody's working off of right now is a five-year average of 50,000. But the latest number that came out, which is a minimum population estimate, where they're actually counting birds, there's no extrapolation, they're flying over staging areas, counting birds, scientists counting birds, 87,000 birds were counted this last year. So we know where there's at least 87,000 birds in the flyway at this point in time. The numbers that we're basing it off of are 50,000 50, bird numbers. So we're on the extreme conservative end of, of these estimates at this point in time. That was my next question about the population statistics and how accurate they, you think they are. So basically you're saying that they're very, very accurate and we're actually basing our uh, permits uh, and our season right. on an even yeah. lower number. The science is solid. I mean, the feds, when the... When the, when the Eastern Population Plan came out in 2010, the feds went out and did environmental assessment. And so an environmental assessment is basically a look at your actions and what your actions are going to have on that population. And so in that case, the actions were harvest and the, and the implications were population going up or down. They looked at what, the, what they were going to do for the hunt plan, what the hunt plan asked for, and they found no impact. And so the environmental impact went through. There's no problem. The hunt plan, as written, uh, believed to have no impact and that's based on uh, the idea of their basic surveys and the surveys get a lot of get a hard time because even the, the feds themselves say this is not a population estimate this is a base number of animals on the ground and so but other research has shown that that base number of animals on the ground is linked to the population so the environmental assessment said yes that is a reasonable way to, to monitor your population to see if it's going up or down and seeing if you're having implications to your population because of your hunt. Uh, the next thing I wanted to ask you to discuss was uh, the amount of money the agency spends at the viewing area at this time, um, which obviously has a lot, you know, helps, you know, the festivals surrounding that area. And that's the, obviously, uh, seems to be the place that Right. Wildlife watchers uh, love to go to see the. Cranes. I need to defer. I know this conversation has been going on between Daryl and John, and I don't know which one of you is more comfortable talking about that. It's I've been talking science; they've been talking numbers. Expenditure sheet here, if you'd like for me to answer it. It's uh, the total TWRA expenditure for the 2012 
was $46,016. Um, of that, though, that includes $21,000 uh, for planting of 90 acres of corn at 240 acre and 15 acres of wheat at 150 an acre. So the actual uh, expenditures for the festival itself were, I, I assume, then um, about 23000 So we were going to plant the, the, um, the crops anyway. And of that, we received $4,500 from the Crane Society to help us in the planting. Uh, last thing, uh, we, how was the, for the date, the prospective date or possible date of closing the season on a Wednesday? Um, what went into that? Um, you know, at first glance, my first initial reaction was maybe we need to, you know, close it sooner to, to make the festival better. But I think in my experience with waterfowl, hunting actually increases the amount of animals or birds or whatever it may be on a non-hunting area. So, you know, the earlier we close, we may actually those birds may figure out they can stay other places safely and not be at the viewing area. But I didn't know how much went into that or if y'all went down that train of thought as well. Haven't gone down that path yet. And so I think at this point, it's, it's trying to be sensitive to the, the multi-use of the, of, the, of the crane. I think in the next two months, we can decide uh, sure. where that goes and where, where, pe where everybody's comfortable with that. Um, but it, I, I think it's simply a, a measure of trying to show that we're, we're we sure. want to make sure these two things can coexist. Yeah, I was just asking from a scientific point of view, what would it could go how, either way. I've heard I, what, I've heard it all over the place, and you know how waterfowl are. It could just be the weather one day, and so and, and crops. Do they eat it out early or not? You know, and so they you right. know the, the the hard part, and that's why some of these you know the staging estimates are just all over the place. You know, any any time you're trying to get, catch waterfowl on a given day, it's a roll of the dice. You know, you get a six or you get a one. You know, and, and so. It, it's, but I think I think we could sit down with the guys that really know that area uh, and come up with a, some reasonable, uh, educated guesses on what would be best for, for best our thing. goals in that area. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I just wanted to add one other quick thing that it came out of that federal stuff, and they were talking about this the poor breeding and the, and the, it goes back into the to your idea of the the science of this, and the feds overall expect about 2,000 birds under this current plan for all the states that are participating they would expect about 2,000 birds to be taken out of this out of this uh, through all the flyway harvesting so you were the, the number of permits is greatly exceeding that but the number of birds actually is taken about 2,000 and they think with about 2,000 birds taken out with a 50,000 number there's probably not going to be any impact the, the population should grow they did some other numbers and they found that even if you if harvest blew up on us and 2,500 birds were taken out of this population, that the, the population would shrink at 2,500 birds taken out. But it would take 30 years for the population to shrink from where the management issue, where the management base is right here to the 30,000 number, which is where we stop hunting. You know, there's a 30,000 bird cutoff where you hunt or don't hunt. So it's going to take us 30 years. So we've got a lot, there's a lot of conservatism built into this. You know, if we over harvest in one year, it's not going to be the end of the world. The feds have built a massive amount of conservatism into this plan. And I'll end. I have one more question. How many states uh, do hunt sandhill grains? Uh, well, in the flyway, in the flyway. In the United States. Do we oh, I'd have to count up. Fifty. How many? Mike. Mike has done a bunch of work, and I'm sure 15. he's going to talk more about it. But it, it, they're, they're harvested in all, all flyways right now except the Atlantic. And so uh, we've got just a few states. Uh, there's some tribal harvest in the Great Lakes states. And then we've got Kentucky. Uh, and then great amount of harvest in the central flyway. And then there's some small pockets that are right on the Pacific uh, central flyway area that are, that are harvested. Those, those populations, the, the western most populations, are extraordinarily small uh, compared to what we have. And they've been hunting them for a long time. Are there other states uh, now involved in the consideration phase as we are? I think there's a lot of people interested. I mean, the, 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 the northern tier states, you know, you look at the breeding, the, those, there's a lot of things that are saying the, the sandhill crane populations are burgeoning, you know, and so we think there's some crane prop, you know, depredation problems here. There's massive crane prop, depredation problems in the northern tier in the Great Lakes states. They're, they're what used to be very small breeding populations in very localized areas. Now their surveys are blowing up uh, into new hot spots across the state. And so the, those populations are growing at a, at a much better rate. Uh, 
and, and so it, it's, uh, I think those states are going to be looking for some harvest. I can't tell you when or where, you know, to speak for them, but I, I think it's, it's brand new. You know, we're only looking at three years into this. Um, uh, so I think there's some other states that with time will we'll jump into the, into the mix. Thank you. I think we're going to take a short break and then come right back. <laughs> 